I, um, so first, let me introduce myself. Hi. Uh, I'm Susan O'Connor, and I am a game writer. That is a job. That is my job. I've been writing for games now for about 15 years. I have worked on probably 25 titles by now, including the Bioshock, Far Cry, and Tomb Raider series and franchises. I also founded the Game Writers Conference, which is part of GDC. Is anyone going to GDC this year? Yeah, I'll see you there. <laughs> and I also teach a course in game writing at the University of Texas at Austin. And I also give talks like this. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here. Uh, this is a hard topic to talk about. It's a hard topic to teach. The way that I have found works best is that it becomes not a monologue from me, but a conversation between us. So I do have slides. I have a talk planned. I'm going to run through it. But I really hope at the end uh, we can have a little bit of Q&A. And um, I know it's a little nerve-wracking to ask, qu ask questions. But just keep in mind, if you have a question, probably 10 other people are thinking the same thing. So you will be doing a favor to your fellow attendees if you're the one who was brave and raises your hand. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to click Next, see if it works. It does. So maybe because I'm a writer, I really love language, uh, not just the English language, but foreign languages as well. I haven't had a chance to study Flemish or Dutch, but uh, when I was in school, I was really nuts for French. I, uh, I spent all high school and all of college studying French, and um, I was an exchange student in the Ivory Coast in high school. And after college, I got a job as an au pair, actually, in Paris for a little while. Uh, so I can speak French like a three-year-old perfectly. Uh, and one of the things I thought was really interesting when I was studying language is understanding that cultures really communicate what's important to them through their language. So I'll use American English as an example. For some reason, American English is all about baseball. I don't know if you've ever noticed this when you talk to Americans. They use baseball terms all the time. They talk about batting a thousand and hitting a home run. Uh, the language is everywhere. And I think Americans don't even realize they're using baseball terms because it's such a part of what we do. But it says a lot about how much we as a culture love sports. Um, and in preparing for this talk, I started thinking about the French language, because uh, I know that's one of the languages you speak here. And one of the things about French is that so much of the language is about food, right? I remember learning about this phrase, the carrots are cooked. <laughs> I was like, that doesn't mean anything, but it means something to French people. A lot of phrases in, uh, in French seem to revolve around food. And I really thought it might be useful to think about this work that I do as a game writer in terms of food and preparing a meal. Uh, and I really am hoping in this talk to like sort of channel one of my personal heroes, which is not the guy on the left, although he's great, but the guy on the right, Anthony Bourdain. Who knows who Anthony Bourdain is? So he's a great storyteller, and he has a lot of passion for his topic, or he did. Uh, and he really made the rest of us excited about it, too. So I hope in the same way that Anthony Bourdain makes audiences want to eat food and travel, I hope that this talk really inspires you to think about what kind of an experience you can create for your players as you build your games. And so in this talk, I really want to use this metaphor of cooking. I want to talk about, because writing is a craft, just like cooking is a craft. And it's all about gathering your ingredients, creating the mise en place, and serving a great meal. And so we're going to unpack that in this talk today. So uh, let's see. Uh, how do we build a game story? Where do we start? Who here has, has tried to write a game story or is writing a game story? Show of hands. OK, great. It's so easy, right? <laughs> it's a nightmare. It's so hard. Uh, I have been doing it for a long time. And uh, when I started writing for games, there were no classes in game writing. There were no books on game writing. You had to just figure it out as you go along. I feel like I've made so many mistakes, and I hope this talk will spare you some of the pain I went through. So here's a three-part way to think about telling stories for games. Step one, know your flavors. So I love this idea, what grows together goes together. Um, the thinking that like, when you bring things together that are meant to be together, something really magical happens. Uh, chefs love this idea about staying regional with their cuisine. And it's a concept that we can use in games as well. And the reason is that 
Food gives us a feeling and games give us a feeling. And so we're trying to create an experience either for the diner if you're the chef or the player if you're a developer. And story and game are two separate ingredients that need to come together in a really meaningful way, right? So let's talk about what I mean here. So it's interesting, right? Because if you, first of all, games are unique in the realm of storytelling mediums in the sense that games don't need a story. Does Tetris need a story? Thank you. In fact, it would ruin it, right? So story has to earn its right into your game. It has to be there because it makes the experience better. And because what is unique and special about games is the gameplay, something I had to learn as a game writer, and believe me, I fought this every step of the way, what I had to learn to do was, if I was gonna tell a good story for a game, I had to start by thinking about the game, right? And not just the game, but the experience that the game was supposed to create in the player's mind. So I'll unpack this a little bit in a second, and we're gonna look at some examples of what I mean, but just to frame what we're talking about, when I say flavors, and I said this already, I mean feelings. And game play and story don't, are not in lockstep every second of your, of your game, right? There are periods where it's pure gameplay when you're solving a puzzle maybe, right? And there's moments of pure story where you're watching a cinematic, and I know that none of you have ever skipped a cinematic. <laughs> Ugh, I have skipped cinematics, so. Um, so there are moments when they are apart, but the moments when they work best is when they are in alignment, when they're working together. And so when I start working on a game, story project, my first question is, what is this, what are we trying to make the player feel? And this is a hard question to answer. Uh, this is something I talk about in my college class when I, I'm teaching at the semester. What I said to them is, if you as game developers want to create feelings in your players, if you want to make them feel something, you start by figuring out what makes you feel something. Yeah? Easier said than done, right? To start to put to words to the, the physical sensations that you have and the thoughts that run through your head when you're having a meaningful experience. Again, let me get specific. Let's look at genres, okay? Let's look at gameplay genres and then let's look at story genres. Just look at the left side for right now. I've listed a couple really simple ones, and I intentionally started with first-person shooters because shooters really tap into the most powerful part of your brain. Which part is that? Does anybody know? Say? Violence? Well, yes. It taps into our fight-or-flight instinct, which as mammals is like the, most, the deepest, most prehistoric part of our brain. That fight or flight instinct that is in all of us is why we're all here today, because our ancestors were able to run away from the saber-toothed tigers, right? So it's very powerful. It's, uh, if it were software, it would be the most optimized, perfect software in our brains, followed by our limbic brain, which is the emotional part of our brain. And then the buggiest, most faulty part of our mental software is the prefrontal cortex, which is where our logical thought is. We actually haven't quite worked the bugs out. <laughs> we're, not, we're not all Mr. Spock. So, so let's talk for a second about this idea that games have a feeling. What do we feel when we play a shooter? What kind of emotions do we experience? Say? Yeah, you feel epic. You feel powerful, right? You feel strong. What else? Stress? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, what else? Anxiety? Mm-hmm. Adrenaline rush, all these things, yes. Fear, mm-hmm, yeah. And right, and that's, and you can start to get specific about that, that menu of flavors that we're talking about, right? So like if I were brought on a project and they said, we're making a shooter, my questions would be, okay, great. Am I running towards the enemy or am I running away from the enemy, right? Am I holding a big, huge gun with a chainsaw at the end of it? Or do I have like a little pea shooter, right? Am I wearing a uniform? Or am I a little girl in a dress? Like, all of these things would create a different emotional experience for me as the player. And that's before we've done any story development at all. Although a little girl in a dress suggests a story for sure. So, so that's an example, right? And it's a little easier to define because they're the most primal emotions that we have, fear and anger and stress. 
Although for some people, first-person shooters are their way of relaxing, so. Uh, what about role-playing games? What do we feel when we play a role-playing game? Those are kind of more subtle emotions. Yeah. Yeah, in interest, curiosity, right? Yeah, absolutely. Not just in the world, but often in the other characters. It's slower gameplay, right? So we've got more time to imagine and wonder and explore. Uh, Action-adventure is a lot like first-person shooters, but maybe with a more playful vibe, I'd say, right? A little bit more, a little less Gears of War, a little more, you know, uncharted, right? Uh, okay, great. So, uh, again, this is something that, like, took me a long time as a game developer to find the courage to talk about in studios because game development is really a left-brain exercise most of the time. And what by that I mean is you're just doing a lot of problem solving, you're dealing with a lot of technology, you're creating systems and you're living inside of spreadsheets, right? And it feels just like work, 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 work. But if you watch somebody play a game, like if it's a good game, it's wee, it's fun, right? And fun is a feeling. And so I think as game writers, what we can do is really be an advocate and a champion for that emotional experience that at the end of the day somehow has to run through that whole gauntlet of spreadsheets and data and code base and somehow reach the player on the other side and make her have a fun experience. So it's a little easier to define the feelings we have in story genres because we mostly have been exposed to story genres through movies and movies really have figured out how to make us feel. So how do we feel when we watch like a romantic comedy? What's that? Friend? Cringy. Per okay, so romantic comedies are not for everybody. <laughs> and that's such an important thing to talk about as well, right? So, like, I'll give you an example. I, I worked on Gears of War. That is not my idea of a good, fun game at all. But I wasn't the target audience. I remember being in user testing, and it, it was like the screen was pointed at me, I was behind the player, and so somebody was like curb stomping someone, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna throw up. But the guy who was playing, the user, the tester, he was giggling like a little girl. Like, he was the target audience, and this game was totally doing it for him. So it's so important to be able to know your audience, and also, pro tip, a big part about being a game writer is learning empathy. Right? So even if you're not the target audience, you may find yourself on a project where you are serving an audience that is different than you. So if I can dig deep and find my inner space marine, you can definitely find your romantic hero somewhere. So romantic comedies are actually, if you're into them, they create a lot of tension, right? And a lot of like humor, like hopefully you laugh, but also you're tense because the, most of the story, the lovers have not come, are not together yet. And you're like, how are they gonna get together? So it's a little bit like a puzzle solving, actually. What about for crime stories? What do we feel in crime stories? Say? I heard, I heard, I heard a murmur. Is that an answer? Yes. Yeah, uh, curiosity again, right? Yeah, exactly. Maybe a little tension with some things at stake. Yes. Yeah, a desire for justice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. Yeah, and then science fiction. Maybe we feel a sense of awe, right? Again, curiosity. Curiosity is a big part of storytelling in general. So, so we've just ran through, like we've got these two different types of flavors, right? And you can mix and match. In the same way you can mix and match wine and cheese, right? Or wine and food. You can, you can think about story and game in that way. So let's look at a couple of examples. Super obvious, right? You're making an action-adventure game? Oh, why don't you tell an action-adventure story in it? Duh, right? It's a sure thing. It's a safe bet, right? Uncharted. Totally works, okay? But they don't have to match perfectly. Again, and same thing with like, again, wine and food, right? You can make an unexpected pairing and if it works, it's really magical. A first-person shooter, a lot of the times, is about a power fantasy, right? You become the strongest guy with the biggest gun. A horror story, a lot of times, is about feeling like a victim, feeling helpless, before standing before a monster who's got all the advantages. 
So this is an interesting tension that's created here, right? Am I powerful or am I weak? Who's, who's going to win here? That's Bioshock, by the way. So it can work, right? Any kind can work if you step back and look at it from this faraway distance and think through what goes together. So, oh, whoops. Oh, I just gave it away. Nuts. Well, anyway, <laughs> I think I'm missing a slide there. OK, well, I'm just going to show you this screen, and then I'm going to tell you why it's here. Uh, there we go. OK, the example I was going to give was a first-person shooter with romantic comedy. You could do it if the player character was Cupid. Right? Because what do we do in a shooter? We shoot. What does Cupid do? Shoots his arrows. Right. So I, I am just sad that I stepped on my own joke there because it's a really great example of how it seems like something that would never work actually could if, if, you, if you position your story and your game correctly. Any questions about that before I go on to the next section? We'll have time for questions at the end, too. Yes? Say again. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's how I figured this out, right? I mean, I, because it, games and stories just don't go well together in general. I mean, it's not, a, it's, not an easy, it's not easy to put them together. They're not a natural fit. But they can go together, and when it works, it's incredible. I mean, it's, it's, it's like nothing else. Um, but to make it happen requires a lot of thought. And it needs to happen much earlier in the development cycle than I think a lot of game developers realize. A lot of game developers call me at the end. And the reason they call me at the end is that everything is a disaster, <laughs> right? And then I charge a lot of money to help them because it's hard work. But what I think to myself is, if y'all had called me a lot earlier, you know, I could have done this a lot cheaper and you would have been a lot less stressed out. But people don't like to buy vitamins, they want to buy aspirin. So, they wait until they're in trouble to like, get serious about the story. But this industry is evolving, right? Our audiences are expecting more from their stories. And as game developers, you are becoming more and more ambitious. And here's the thing. You know, there was a time when like, games were like, really buggy and they, all the games crashed all the time. And there was a time when the animation was really clunky and goofy and the music was dumb and the story was dumb. And it was just early days in game development. Well, today, Every game's code base is pretty solid. Everybody's animation looks great. Everyone's music is phenomenal. The design works. The one place I think where you really see a huge variation in terms of quality is the storytelling. So if you can tell a good story in your game, automatically you are separated yourself from the pack. So it's hard work, but I think it's worth doing. OK, so we, we have three steps. We ran through step one. Uh, I'm going to look at my clock real quick. How am I doing on time? I am perfect. OK, step two, find your recipe. So I'm using the metaphor of a recipe instead of rules, because storytelling is art, and there are no rules in art. However, there are certain things that seem to work predictably. And knowing about what tends to work will give you, again, a huge step up in uh, creating a story for your game. So um, oh look, cookbooks. So here's a, here's a cookbook that I like, I recommend quite heavily uh, for storytelling. It's called The Anatomy of Story by John Truby. It's for screenwriters. So that's my big caveat. I am not recommending a game writing book because I haven't found one yet that seems to get the job done. In fact, I'm going to write one. So if you have any questions about game writing, I want you to email them to me. It will help me write my book. <laughs> and I will answer your questions right away. I won't wait until the book comes out to answer them. But I find that this is a really helpful place to start understanding the kind of recipes that you can use for story development, right? So you can take a recipe that's designed for a movie and adapt it for a game. So let's start, just for, the, just for now, let's talk about a movie. The reason I'm using a movie instead of a game is that we've all experienced this. If you've seen this movie, you have seen the story the exact same way that I saw it which, of course, is what makes it so different from games. So for the sake of all of us tracking this, uh, by the way, has everybody seen this movie? Show of hands. OK. I, in my college class, I started talking about this movie, and it turned out half of them hadn't seen it. And I just was like, oh my god, kill me now. 
<laughs> am I that old? OK, I guess I am. Um, OK, so here's the recipe. Ready? It's so, it's so basic, and it's so simple. What does our hero want? What does he want? Victory. Yeah, basically, right? He starts out just wanting to get off the farm, right? We don't start our stories with like our final ultimate desire. We have to build up to it. So at first he's just annoyed and bummed and trapped and bored, right? But then things progress, things escalate, and eventually he wants to, what? say again? Get the, girl. get the girl, save the princess, right? Which sort of evolves into save the day, save the universe, right? I love this example because Star Wars is a game for kids, I mean a movie for kids in a lot of ways, and so the storytelling is very in your face. It's not very subtle, which for the sake of a conference is perfect. Okay, Luke wants to save the day. Oh, and by the way, that's our hero, right? Luke's our hero. That's gonna come, that's gonna be important later when we talk about games, okay? We'll come, think about that, or hang on to that. Who is standing in his way? Darth Vader, the, um the Empire as represented by Darth Vader. Right, that's an easy one. And if you're ever working on your story and you're having a hard time getting clear on what the desire is, just look at who the enemy is, right? That'll help you. Okay, what's Luke's plan? That's a big question and every answer is correct because the plan is 80% of the movie. It's all the stuff that he does. But for the sake of this talk, let's put it under an umbrella, which is that he learns how to fight. He learns what he needs to do in order to be a successful fighter, right? In order to save the princess and win the day. And then, easy, where does the final battle take place? I want to get you guys used to talking so when we get to Q&A, you'll ask some questions. That's right, Death Star. And here's a tough one. What does he realize in the final battle? <laughs> no, that's the second movie. <laughs> the father reveal doesn't happen until later. Say again? He's strong. Well, right, so right before that, so think about Obi-Wan comes to him, right? He's right there, he's in the chute, it's about to go down. He's ready, right? Red leader, red leader, to bring it back. And then what does Obi-Wan say? Use the force, Luke. Hasn't been, he's been using the force the whole movie, right? But he means something different now, doesn't he? Yes. I just heard it. Trust? Yes. Yes. He realizes that he has not used the force yet. Not the way it's, he, doesn't, he hasn't understood until now. Suddenly his whole mind opens up and he understands what Obi-Wan has been trying to teach him this whole time. That the force binds us together. That it is greater than all of us and we can surrender to it. And that's what he does, right? He lifts up his reticle and he closes his eyes and he shoots. And he wins, right? He wins by surrendering, which is kind of awesome, actually. Kind of unexpected. Uh, and that's it, he wins the day. Victory, yay! So I mentioned that I wanted to talk about the idea of um, taking this recipe, which is a movie recipe, and adapting it into a game. So if we were gonna make a game of that exact story, which character would you wanna play? <laughs> Everybody wants to be Han Solo. Of course you do, he is the coolest, right? He is totally awesome, he's got the best ship, best attitude, best sidekick. Why is Han Solo more fun in a game, do you think? Yes? Hmm? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He's just fun, yeah. No conflicts? He's not a Mary Sue. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't, he's, he's pretty simple. Right? He's not all caught up with his like, emotional problems like Luke is. But we love the movie. We love the movie because there is somebody in the movie who is going through something, who is experiencing character change, who is facing a challenge that he may or may not overcome. So if you were going to make a movie about Star Wars, and yes. Well, yeah, me too. I feel you. Yeah, yeah. Right, you've got the advantage of future sight. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, so I agree. I think, I think the two candidates are on the right. But we need Luke, 
If we told the story without Luke, there would be nothing there. Might be some cool like pew, 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 like gun battles in space, right? But like there'd be no story. So the key to storytelling in games is give the player someone fun to play, but make someone in the story, an NPC, have a struggle. Because that's what's interesting to us. Other people's pain and suffering is very interesting to us. Right? This is great. I love this line from Mel Brooks. He says, comedy, wait, how does he put it? Tragedy is when I stub my toe, and comedy is when you fall down a manhole and die. <laughs> it's terrible, but you laughed. <laughs> We are, as humans, interested in other people's adventures. Let's put it that way. And other people's challenges. And we like stories that we don't know the ending to yet. And when you make the player character the hero, the story is a given. If I'm, so that's, it's just, that's a little complicated. I won't go there, but anyway. Okay, so we've talked about two steps. Find your flavors, find your recipe. Now we're on the third and final step, which is gather your ingredients. And I'm gonna run through this kind of quickly. Uh, so we have time for a couple of questions. Super fast, uh, easiest way to start building out your character examples, don't get into long bios and, I mean, they're great, they're fun, but don't do that first. The first place to start is with archetypes. And the reason is archetypes are a shorthand for everybody. It is a place, if you stop with archetypes, you've got very boring, predictable characters. But if archetypes are like the foundation that you build your character on, Audiences, players will get it right away, they'll be interested in them right away, they'll come to life very quickly. This is an example of three different kinds of an archetype. This is the warrior. These are three very different characters, right? Aragon, Luke, and Sundance from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, which is required viewing of everybody. <laughs> if you haven't seen this movie yet, I insist you see it. It's so good. Um, but they're all extremely uh, unique. They feel distinct, but they're all warriors. See these guys? Oh, that's my alarm about Q&A. Um, these guys are both rebels. Loki is a rebel archetype, and Rick from Casablanca, the guy on the right, right, is also a rebel. Completely different characters. Same energy. So you start there, right? Because blank page is scary as a writer. You gotta start somewhere. Start with an archetype. Is it the wise old man? Is it the rebel? Is it the warrior? And then once you have something on the page, you want to give them something they want. They need to want something. And this is, movies are so much better at this than we are, it's embarrassing. In fact, they're so good at it, they usually just put it right in the title. What does Tom Hanks want? Yeah, yeah, bingo, exactly, right? And because we love Tom Hanks, we're rooting for him all the way. We care about people who care about things. A lot of NPCs in games feel like they're just hanging in a closet doing nothing until you walk in the room. And then when you walk in the room, they come to life, they give you some directions, then they go back in the closet, <laughs> right? We care about characters that are alive and are concerned about more than just us, that want something and are willing to do anything to get it. They want what they want desperately and they'll get it or die trying, like Andrew Ryan and Bioshock. And that is my tip about characters, you want to give strong desires to the characters that you as a writer can control. And the only characters you can control are the non-player characters. The player is totally out of your control. Believe me, I've tried to get the player to do what I want, it never listens, it's a losing battle. But you can still tell a great story in a game if you just create a Luke Skywalker to balance out your Han Solo. And then you cook and serve the meal. Uh, which is ridiculously impossible because your, your, the person eating your meal is not waiting in the dining room patiently. He's in the kitchen with you, like cooking alongside you. So part two of my talk, if I ever come back, I will talk about how do you deal with the fact that the player is in the kitchen with you creating the meal at the same time you are. But I want to stop for now uh, and maybe take a few questions if there's time. Thank you so much. There's a lot of smoke in here. If there's any questions, yeah. So, hi. hi. I cannot see you, so I just assume I'm making eye contact. See me now? Okay, there you okay, are. Good. Hi. So, um, I was wondering 
because you're a writer, so you definitely get a writer's block. And ah. At some point, you hit a wall and you don't know what, what to do anymore. Okay, you're in the middle of the writing the game. You get the character to do this and that, but then you think, okay, what's next? What do you do when you get something like that? So there's a couple of things you can do. Um, I'm, a big, I'm a big believer in that mm, creatives are a community and we all have to help each other. And by helping each other, I mean stealing from each other. So there are sometimes when you need to get started, one of the best ways you can get unstuck when you are stuck is look for someone who has solved the problem you're trying to solve, right? Because someone else has, for sure. And you can look really close, meaning you can look at other games. Like, I'm trying to create a character that the player will care about and I don't know what to do. What games have I played where I cared about the character? I'm gonna go play it and check it out, right? And you can, don't stop there. You can look at movies, you can look at books, you can look at your own life. That's, that's the real pro tip there. If you get stuck with something, think about, try to define the problem because it's probably something about either a relationship the player has with them, the character has with himself or herself or with someone else. And maybe you have faced something similar in your life. And maybe you dealt with it well or maybe you dealt with it badly, but any kind of answer will help you get unstuck. I, yeah, I think also timed writing is really good. I don't know if anyone's ever done that exercise. I do it every morning. I do 10 minutes of this free writing. You don't stop moving your pen. It somehow gets the flow of subconscious going. I mean, it's complete garbage. I mean, it's just like, I don't know what to write, this coffee is terrible, I'm tired, uh. But something about the hand moving kind of lets the brain know like, oh, I guess I'm a writer, look at me writing, huh. It just turns the brain on a little bit, so. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, hi. Hi. I'm, I'm yeah, you're the, back here. You're the man yeah. with the mic. <laughs> um, so in a lot of games, players skip certain sections. No. How do you deal as a writer trying to tell the whole story but still <laughs> missing a lot, like, mm -hmm. or like leaving freedom for the player to choose how they go through the game? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, Han Solo. <laughs> The way that I do it is I recognize, I don't fight reality. Players are going to skip what they're gonna skip, right? So I look for people who have solved that problem. And I think that one of the ways that game developers have figured out to solve this problem, and this is super counterintuitive, but it works, you can create a story and then you just hide it from the player. Like, you sense that this is a living world and something interesting is going on here, but like you don't know what it is. You have to seek it out to find out what's going on. That's like pull storytelling, which is very different than push storytelling. So push storytelling is when the developers stop the game and push a cinematic on you, right? And like it's very annoying. Even if you love story, like I do. Like it just bugs me. If it's not, the pacing isn't right, I'm like, ugh, skip. So. You've got to make the story and the gameplay integrated. And the way that you can do that, like I said, is like put the story in the world and then create the, it's, it's such that the player has to discover what the story is. It's a really complicated question. I could talk for a day on it. So that's just the tip of the iceberg, but I hope that helps. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, I was uh, wondering if you've had moments in the industry where, like, how is the dynamic between if you need to change the story, depending if the developer or anyone else changes, so like, hey, we're doing this, could you change the story, depending on this mechanic, for example? Mm -hmm. So, are you asking how I deal like, with that when I, someone asks? I mean, does that <laughs> happen before? And, like, well, how do you deal with that? Nobody ever, ever, no, I'm just kidding, of course. It's all they ever do. <laughs> it's all I'm ever told, it's change the story. Um, the way that I, uh, and again, I guess, I guess the way that I deal with it partly is I really put my storytelling energy into the non-player characters because they seem to not get in the way of the game designer the same way that the avatar does. If I build a story around the avatar, that is really a rickety, precarious place to be because the gameplay changes all the time and it should change, that's correct. Um, so I really focus on creating characters and motivations, meaning desires. Uh, that are in the world, and then the player slash, I see the player and the designer as one. Because the designer gives the player the powers to be in the world. Meaning, 
allows her to run and, and shoot and fly and sing, whatever, whatever verbs. Uh, and so I see the, the player designer interacting with the story, and then the story responds. And if the gameplay changes, the story can change in the same way that when you do a dance, right? If the dancer goes this way, you're like, oh, okay, I guess I'll follow you. If it's a dance, the story is following the game design. And so you're gonna move, it's gonna change. Uh, the trick is to just under, like, create a really good solid underpinning for the story, so like the spine is correct, and then everything around it can be flexible and change. There's only a few things you really need to protect. And, and the anatomy of story actually is a good resource for finding out what that is. But yeah, flexibility is key in game writing. So I think when we might be almost out of time, yeah, so maybe yeah. this is the last question. Yes, so okay. when do you choose between show and tell? So uh, I actually believe in do, don't show. So uh, I try to never tell. I think dialogue is, uh, I mentioned this in the workshop earlier, dialogue is the, if, you, um, if you're a chef, like, like dialogue is the, is the weakest, dullest knife you've got. It's the least effective one. It's the one you go to last. Because players don't listen. They might have the audio off. They might be talking. It just doesn't engage them. It, it just it seems to interrupt the flow for players. And they really have mastered the art of not listening. So, so my goal is to really think about do, don't show. And the way I do that is I start by thinking about the gameplay genre and the mechanics that are baked into it and what that feels like. And then I, my whole story is designed to resonate with those mechanics, with what the player is doing. Hope that helps. Uh, we'll just make time for just one final question. Sure. Whoever's in charge of time, I can be here all day, but yeah. Someone else is coming up next. Hi. Um, hi. Um, uh, I'm a comedian and also just a gamer, not a cool. professional, but just a gamer. Awesome. And um, uh, about what you said earlier about people not listening to the, you know, the characters that are talking and everything, mm -hmm. um, I feel like uh, when I played, for instance, uh, GTA San Andreas, like yeah. I was just really enjoying like the radio talk and also the the characters being really funny, like OG Loke and stuff. Totally. And um, uh, I was wondering, are there comedians in this? Like they ha there have to there has to be some comedians that write for games too. Yeah, totally. Comedians love games. I don't know why. Like it seems like a perfect fit. Uh, but what games haven't done yet is figured out how to bring comedians in to the process, because they should. They would bring so much. Like, I remember hearing a story once about, uh, I, think, I think it was Uncharted, and they needed to record some of the dialogue that happens during gameplay, so they, so they sat down with the level, and they first sat down with the, the two guys who had designed the level, and they recorded everything they said to each other while they were playing it. So it was just two dudes yapping, like, like dudes yap, right? Um, and then they did it again, and they brought in the actors who were going to be playing the characters. And then those guys played the level, and they ad-libbed, and they recorded that. So then they had a script from the level designer, so really responsive to gameplay, and then there were scripts from the actors really responding to the character and the emotional journey, and then they mushed them together and then added a few extra lines for whatever, and then that was it. And it just created a script that felt really alive. Because it was. It was literally written to respond to the moment. And that's what comedians are so good at, is being in the moment. And uh, something about game development doesn't seem to allow for that creative process, and it should, because I think that comedians are like a untapped resource of like solid gold. I wish there was more of them. Because I know, when it works, it works, for sure. And it doesn't even have to be a funny game. I think comedians would just bring something to any genre, because I think co comedians are really interested in the human condition. They are interested in the joke that is being a person. <laughs> like, we are just kind of ridiculous creatures. And comedians somehow laugh about it in a really wonderful way. And I think that bringing in some of that humanity could really transform some of the games out there. So I hope you get into it. You're invited. Yeah, OK, great. Thanks, everybody.